Well, what happened last week? Oh, you do? Well, then you yeah, can you can here. put them all together. I was here, yeah, but I had missed two weeks ago. Okay. Hello, good evening. Hi, Maxine, how are you? Good. Hello, Facebook. Facebook hear me okay? All good? That sounded fine. Well, let's get started then. So, all right, I'm signing off of Facebook. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we ask you to send forth your Holy Spirit upon us, to enlighten our minds and open our hearts to receive what you would ask us to receive. 
Please increase our faith and trust in you. As we ever go undergo spiritual desolation, that we may know the reasons why, and with those reasons, gain greater hope to persevere until we reach that goal you have set for us. We ask all this through the intercession of St. Ignatius. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What do you know? What is this? Okay. Am I, am I supposed to take one? Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Anna. That's so sweet of you. All right. Ah. Very good. We've been continuing our lessons on St. Ignatius's 14 Rules for Discernment of Spirits. We've covered the majority of them now. We have six left. Yes, six left. Three weeks. All right which means we will finish the week before Christmas. Uh, I'd love to do a review week, but that would mean we'd have to do the week after Christmas, which is probably not a good idea. But we'll see how that goes. Um, anyways, we've kind of covered a bit of this topic before in Rule 6, I believe, but we're going to go much more in depth. And certainly there's this question which St. Ignatius seeks to answer in this upcoming rule, and that is... Why does a God who loves us permit us to undergo times of spiritual desolation? Right? This is a very real and key question, right? No doubt many of us, if probably not all of us, have asked this question ourselves in a time of spiritual desolation, right? Most likely at a time of great you know, difficulty, this is a very important question to many people. And of course, if St. Ignatius was not to try and answer this question, his set of rules would be woefully incomplete, right? And of course, he does answer this, right, in Rule 9, and as well as a little bit of what we've already covered, right? Rule 9, right, is given to us for the same reasons that Rules 5 through 8 were given to us, right? to help those in spiritual desolation. Because as we know, spiritual desolation, uh, our, even though our response to that is supposed to be to reject it, and that's not our most important action to take, right? The most important action to take is to accept spiritual consolation. But we really don't usually have trouble doing that. We have a much more difficulty rejecting and resisting spiritual desolation. And so, St. Ignatius devotes most of his rules to helping us do just that, right? And so Rule 9 will also be helping us to resist and reject spiritual desolation, just like the past four have been. I'm going to use this example. Holy Thursday, Jesus is at the Last Supper with his apostles, right? He's giving them his last words to them before the final passion, right? He says many things to them, and among these things he says, But now I am going to the one who sent me. Right? He's going to leave them, he says. Right? Because I told you this, grief has filled your hearts. But I tell you the truth, it is better for you that I go. For if I do not go, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So those words by Jesus in the Last Supper, it is better for you. That I go, right? We ask the question, why, right? Why is this happening? Why is the Lord letting me experience spiritual desolation? The answer is, it is better for you that I go, right? These words are incredibly helpful in the spiritual life in general, and then discernment of spirits in particular, immensely fruitful, these words from our Lord. Of course, we see in these words from our Lord that He's steering his disciples away from the desolation part, right? He's, he's admitting that, right? I'm going to go. Grief has filled your hearts. But he's trying to direct their sight, their thinking, to the forward, right? It's better that I go because then I'm going to send you the Spirit, right? My passion must take place so that we can have the resurrection and all this stuff, right? So he's getting them to think outside their immediate grief towards a certain goal here. Of course, we need to remember that spiritual desolation, right, is a tactic of the enemy, right? And of itself, 
it does not bear fruit, right? This is something the enemy does, and he doesn't like fruit to be born in our souls. Right? But if we resist the desolation, if we take these words to heart, right, there can be fruit that can come from spiritual desolation after we have passed through it and come out the better. So let us turn then to Rule 9. There are three principal causes for which we find ourselves desolate. So this is a long rule. We're just going to take it little by little. Three principal causes, right? These are the reasons for it, why we would ask, why would God let this happen? And while we say causes, we mean right, God's reason for it. As I was saying before already, spiritual desolation is caused by the enemy. That's not what we're talking about here, right? The causes, meaning the causes why God would let us undergo spiritual desolation, right? God's reason for this will be that he's hoping, or I'm not really hoping that's the right word, but he desires us to reap some sort of fruit from this experience, right? So there's kind of three fruits we could say that God is hoping us to gain, right? And it's, again, it's only if we resist this spiritual desolation. If we do not resist, then we will not get these, right? These are the three reasons why God would let us undergo them, so we may gain certain fruit, right? If we are aware, if we understand, and if we take the action of resisting and rejecting the desolation. All right, let's go for the first one, right? What is the first cause? The first is because we are tepid, slothful, or negligent in our spiritual exercises, and so through our faults, spiritual consolation withdraws from us. All right? So the first reason is because it's our fault, in some sense, right? In the context of our daily lives, we're just kind of slacking on maybe our prayer life or some spiritual exercise or really anything to do with our spiritual life, right? There's some sort of slack in this involved. And so God will withdraw his spiritual consolation. He'll let spiritualist desolation take its place. And he does this as a wake-up call for us, right? So that we can be awake that, okay, you know, that's what happened, right? I usually do this. I stopped doing this, right? God's trying to say, wake up. You know, you're, you're going backwards for a second, right? And this invitation from God, right, comes from his love, right? He sees that we're being negligent, and he loves us, and he wants us to be freed from that fault of ours. And so he invites us to conversion by letting the spiritual desolation come into our souls. So if you remember from, I think it was our second class, uh, we have this two types of people that St. Ignatius is talking about. There's the rule one people, right, who are essentially regressing in their relationship with God. They're going away from God towards serious sin, right? And then there's the rule two person who is essentially progressing towards God, right? Going from greater, greater, you know, these are the people that love the Lord, they want to serve the Lord, right? And all the rest of the rules have to do with the rule two people. So here in Rule 9, we're still dealing with that person, right? The person who is going towards God, who is essentially in their life progressing towards God, right? But in a determined moment, in a specific area in their spiritual life, there is a regression, right? In some small part in their life, they are going backwards, right? There is this fault, this negligence, this sloth. God seeks to heal us from this regression by permitting desolation as a wake-up call, right? So we can take care of that, right? Hopefully we take care of it, we're aware of it, we fix it. Okay, we're back on track. An example... Six months ago, a woman began dedicating 20 minutes to prayer each morning. Before the activity of the day, she would spend these minutes meditating on the gospel of the day's mass. She grew to love this practice and experienced its fruits. Since she began this prayer, she found that her faith was more alive. Sunday mass now meant more to her. She felt God's presence more readily throughout the day. She grew more patient with her children and more loving in general. 
she knew that the change in her had become a blessing for the whole family. All right, that was six months ago. Three weeks ago, all of her children caught a severe flu. There were visits to the doctor and largely sleepless nights. At the same time, her husband was working overtime on a pressing business project, and she had less help at home than usual. Christmas was close, and the season also added to the pace of life. In the midst of chaotic days, of constant demands on her time and energy and a growing tiredness, the 20 minutes of prayer in the morning were swept away. The children's illness passed. Her husband completed his project and the holiday season ended. Life returned to its normal pace. Today, several weeks later, she is driving to school to meet the children. As she drives, she realizes that she no longer feels the closeness with the Lord that she had loved in this past year. Her faith seems less alive, her confidence in God diminished, and her sense of God's love less present. She finds herself missing and desiring her former daily relationship with God. She then realizes that she has not resumed the 20 minutes of prayer dropped some weeks earlier in the time of pressure. Right. This is that. She realizes what's going on. And so she just makes a decision. Let's get back to it, right? Boom. That's it, right? That's the first cause. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's do another example from... Yeah, it's your first example on the example page, Rule 9, from A Diary by St. Ignatius. Later at another time, when much consoled, I thought that I was satisfied. That is, I thought that it was better not to be consoled by God our Lord. If the lack of his visitation was due to my not having disposed myself or helped myself throughout the day or in giving place to some thoughts that distracted me from his words in the sacrifice, the Mass, and from his divine majesty. So at this point in St. Ignatius' life, he has such a habitual communion with the Lord that he's able to discern when these moments happen, when he just kind of slips out of that communion. He understands that this is part of his, you know, attention to his prayers, his mass, you know. So he's seeing that this is happening in his life. And so <clears throat> I thought it would be better not to be consoled in the time of my faults, and that God our Lord orders this, who loves me more than I love myself, for my greater spiritual benefit, so that it is better for me to walk straight, not only in the sacrifice, but throughout the day, in order to be visited. Right? Especially those lines right there, that idea of, especially my Lord who loves me more than I love myself. Right? He thinks like, oh, there's a reason why my Lord who loves me more than I love myself would allow me to do this. And he thinks, actually, I'm grateful that he's done this for me. You know, That idea like, if I was in charge of my spiritual life, I would probably never withdraw spiritual consolation from myself, you know, if I was in charge. But because my Lord loves me more than I love myself, he understands that it is sometimes good to withdraw that consolation and to let the desolation come in and, again, that wake-up call. So for each of these causes, right, there is a fruit. The first one, our fault, right? Negligence, some sloth, we're slipping. The fruit that the Lord wants us to have is conversion, right? That second part only happens if we're aware and we understand and we resist it, right? Snap out of it. We receive the wake-up call and we resist it. And we gain that conversion that our Lord is leading us towards, right? So, that being said, the first cause. How many of us, this is a rhetorical question, do not answer. How many of us, right, maybe even before coming into this room today, after asking the question, why would a God allow me to experience spiritual desolation, would consider the answer fully answered by this number one thing, right? How many of us would think that the only reason I would experience spiritual desolation 
is because it's my fault. Right? Right? Many people think that. But St. Ignatius does not. Right? He thinks there are two other reasons in which we may experience spiritual desolation that have nothing to do with it being our fault. Right? That is very relieving. Right? It's not always our fault. Um, <laughs> As I've been saying many times, right, there is no shame in experience spiritual desolation, even when it is our fault, right? As long as we are aware, we understand, and then we take action, right? It's a wake-up call because we need to be waking up. All right, so let's look at these other two. The second, to try us and see how much we are and how much we let ourselves in His service and praise without so much payment of consolations, and desolation. Oh, sorry, consolations and increased graces. This is that idea, right? I'm sure you've heard before. You know, I came off this retreat, or when I first started getting into the faith, I had such this spiritual high. It was amazing, and then it went away. And then maybe you told someone you thought something was wrong, and someone a little more mature in the spiritual life would say something like, that's just to make sure you love the God of consolations more than you love the consolations of God. Right? You've ever heard something like that before, right? You like the God of the gifts more than you like the gifts from God, right? So this is a, a trial for us, right? To try us and see, right? The trial and to see part, God already knows, obviously. Uh, the seeing part is for us so that we see, do I really love the Lord because He's my Lord? or because he gives me nice spiritual consolations, right? I only know the truth in that answer if I'm tested, right? If I undergo the trial. Only then do I really know my relationship with my Lord. And often going through the trial proves it one way or another, right? As we'll see. So, the cause, there is a trial, and the fruit is learning, right? God permits spiritual desolation as a trial from which learning may result, again, only if we're aware and understand and resist. Might we you know, progress, gain wisdom, gain some growth, mature? These are the type of things that can happen when we undergo a spiritual desolation, and it's not our fault, right? It's simply a trial, right? And as we were talking about last week, we'll always have the grace to resist in the trial, right? We always will. So why does a God who loves us permit us to undergo times of spiritual desolation? All right, on your example page, you'll see Lucia. We've actually already talked about Lucia before, and I've already quoted this, so you actually don't have the examples from Rule 2. So in Rule 2, I, I shared this example from Lucia. Now I'll just read it here, and then we'll jump to that one um, right now. So this is right, Lucia, she goes to a retreat. The retreat is incredibly fruitful for her, right? And then she travels home. She gets in the car and she starts driving home. And she's talking to her retreat director here. That experience I had as I was leaving after my retreat a month ago made quite an impression on me. It certainly took me by surprise. My mind was in such confusion that I couldn't comprehend what was happening to me. I didn't understand how I could feel so bad so fast after feeling so good for so long. On my way home, I was second-guessing my entire retreat and felt that, due to my failure, it had been a complete waste of time. I figured that I must have some serious problem and that maybe I had been dishonest by not bringing it up during the retreat. And since I didn't even know what the problem was, I concluded that I was probably incapable of making a good retreat because I was incapable of being honest and open. The thought came to me that I should not waste your time and mine with these retreats. When I thought about calling about it, calling you about it, I ran into some more obstacles. I felt that I really had no right to bother you. After all, my retreat was over. If things weren't resolved during the retreat, that was my own fault. Right? So she's obviously in spiritual desolation here after being in a lot of spiritual consolation at her retreat. She's leaving. She's now in intense spiritual desolation, and she's doubting everything, and again, she thinks it's her fault. There's something wrong with me. Right? 
And so she, again, she wants to go talk to her spiritual director because she's confused. Uh, rule 13. And all these obstacles come in the way, right? To stop her from doing that because the devil really doesn't want her to, you know, bring another person into this scenario here, right? To get her clarity. Anyways, if we're reading this, we have zero indication that Lucia has any negligence, right? In fact, she's probably been doing even more than she would normally do, right? So it's probably not that first reason, right? It's probably another reason, which is exactly what her retreat director tells her, right? She does call the retreat director. The director gives her this answer. And then Lucia writes now, and this one is the one on your, your thing. So it was truly the grace of God that prompted me to make that phone call. And your words and prayers revealed the truth to me. I realize now more than ever how much God loves me, how much I need him, and I am more determined than ever to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus, to follow him, to serve him, and to do his will. Um, do you need something? You're just going on a walk? Okay. Cool, cool. All right, right. So... That being said, right, those final words that are on there for your example paper of Lucia, right? We ask ourselves that question, right? This one. Why does a God who loves us permit us to experience times of spiritual desolation? If we ever have an experience of spiritual desolation, and at the end of it, we're able to say those words that Lucia says, I now realize more than ever how much God loves me, right? Would there be a reason why God then would maybe allow us to experience that desolation, right? If I'm able to come away with that kind of attitude, right? I now realize more than ever, right? That's a fruit of her spiritual desolation, or rather persevering and resisting through it, or same thing. She now realizes more than ever how much she needs him. Again, that's a great fruit of her going through this trial. She now is more determined than ever to keep her eyes fixed on Jesus, right? If we can ever say these words after a time of spiritual desolation, then we have the answer to this question, right? It's the trial. The Lord is trying to draw us into greater maturity and growth in our spiritual life. All right, St. Francis of Assisi. See on here? Yes, he is. All right, so we see here there's this young brother, Franciscan brother, goes to brother St. Francis, right? And he, he needs help, right? He's experiencing um, a lot of spiritual desolation, and from the desolation comes temptations, right? We've talked about that before. So he's very discouraged about this, right? So what does it say here? Well, he says first, Pray for me, kind Father, for I am sure that I will be immediately freed from my temptations if you will be kind enough to pray for me. For I am afflicted above my strength, and I know that this is no secret to you. All right, so now we're going to note St. Francis' consoling words to this brother. Francis said to him, Believe me, son, for I think... You are for that reason more truly a servant of God. Right? Do we just kind of feel that uplift of heart from those words? He was so discouraged right? and to hear those words from St. Francis. And know that the more you are tempted, the more you will be loved by me. Again, such consoling words from St. Francis, a truly humble man. And he added, I tell you in truth, no one must consider himself a servant of God until he has undergone temptations and tribulations. Right, this is rule nine, second cause, which we are talking about, right? Growth in God's service through spiritual tribulations and the accompanying temptations. Temptation overcome, he said, is in a way a ring with which the Lord espouses the soul of his servant to himself. Right? That's how St. Francis sees spiritual you know, desolation and temptations, right? As an espousal from the Lord, that he wants this particular soul to be that much closer to him, right? 
for him to really mature in his relationship, to grow. Believe me, son, for that reason, you are more truly a servant of God. Right? Those words can be true for us. Right? All right, these are Father Timothy Gallagher's words. Without spiritual desolation, we would remain spiritual children. Right? Not in the sense of, I'm a son of God, that's good. This is more the idea of an immaturity, a spiritual immaturity, right? Again, we begin often in the spiritual life with a, some consolation, right, to help us along. Um, but if we never left there, we would be very different than most other saints, right, who had to go through such intense, you know, spiritual desolation and torments and temptations and all this stuff, right? And it was because they went through that that they were at a higher level than they ever would have been had they never gone through it, right? This idea of spiritual childhood. Because right? as we look back probably to our own past, if we look back to those times of spiritual desolation, we'll probably see that it kind of forced us or compelled us to take new and bold steps in our spiritual life, right? Maybe that was the thing that pushed us to finally, you know, read the Bible every day, or to finally I'll start going to Mass more frequently, you know, or, you know, I, I approached, you know, my prayer with greater intensity, so much more, you know, a lot of times it was the desolation that kind of prompted this or compelled it. Because if I wasn't going to do that, I was going to fall or something like this, you know. It forces us to grow and mature in ways we never would have under simply consolation. Okay, and again, because God loves us and wants so much more for us, He wants us to get out of this spiritual childhood into a spiritual maturity. And so He lets the desolation come because He loves us. All right, let's go to the third reason. Okay. The third is to give us true recognition and understanding. as a clear understanding of the mind so that we may interiorly feel. That's a felt perception of the heart, right? An affective movement. We may interiorly feel that it is not ours to attain or maintain, right? Causing spiritual consolation or maintaining spiritual consolation. Increased devotion, intense love, tears, or any other spiritual consolation, but that all is the gift and grace of God our Lord, right? This is the key to the third cause here, right? That it is the Lord's doing to do this stuff, right? And when we undergo spiritual desolation, usually when we switch between consolation to desolation, we now know in like a felt sense, right? In the flesh, we experience the truth of that statement, that it is God who does this and not me, right? I cannot maintain this. I never brought it about. I can't do anything to stop it from leaving, right? Once it does leave and desolation does come, we now know right? Undeniably. Okay, that wasn't me. You know, that's the Lord's. And so that we may not build a nest in something belonging to another, raising our mind in some pride or vainglory. And this is like the potential pitfall we might fall in had that consolation not been withdrawn. We may become so accustomed to that consolation that we really think it is our doing, right? Because I'm so prayerful or because I'm doing this or that exercise. That's why I have consolation, right? That's a big pitfall to fall into. And God would seek to save us from this pitfall. Attributing to ourselves the devotion or other parts of the spiritual consolation. So, as we see, right, the text of this third cause is longer than both the first and the second combined. And in fact, is longer than several of the rules in their entirety. Right? This is perhaps the only part in the 14 rules where St. Ignatius kind of moves away from his sparse, you know, dense wording. He kind of just lets himself go. It seems like that. Which means that this, for St. Ignatius, is probably very important, right? That he would spend so much words on something, which he just doesn't do, like, in any of the other rules. It is not ours. That's the key. Consolation is not ours. 
either to create or maintain. So these rules are, of course, given in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, a very large set of exercises. And in the exercises, he says that humility is that space right, in which all the other virtues will come from. Right? That is what this third cause is about, you know, humility. Again, at times we experience the joy of spiritual consolation for quite some time, right? Days, maybe weeks, maybe more. And we may become, begin to think, again, that pride, this is my doing. And so God may then permit spiritual desolation ahead of time so that we don't even get that close, right? We don't even have the opportunity to think, that's me, right? So he's even preventing us from making a fault, by allowing desolation to come in. And remember, the humility, right? Such humility will lead to an openness and a dependence on God. And if we have that, everything else we need is going to come, right? Humility, humility, humility. So, we know our causes and the fruits that God wants us to gain from it. Third, consolation is a gift. Because it's a gift, the Lord would love us, desires us, to reap the fruit of humility by simply recognizing that truth when desolation comes, right? Because it's hard to deny, right? I didn't create the consolation, I can't keep it around. Unless we think that number one is, again, the only reason why we would ever experience desolation, right? We need to break that. That is not true, right? Because, again, that's kind of a form of pride, to thinking, if I was just better, I would always have consolation, which is not true. God in His providence gives it to us when He thinks we need it. So we can sum up the whole of Rule 9 like this. He has reasons. His love has reasons. It is a threefold expression of love, a love that brings healing from our faults, a love that gives growth out of our spiritual immaturity, and a love that helps us avoid a pitfall, the most dangerous pitfall in the spiritual life, pride, right? This is why God allows spiritual desolation, because of love. Hmm. All right. Sorry, did you want me to go back? You were writing those down. <laughs> Any questions on Rule 9? Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, that's, that's perfect. That's exactly what this is talking about, that second cause, right? Um, but also maybe number one. Um, certainly, you know, if a child is being spoiled, then you would have discipline because you love the child, right? Scripture also talks about those fathers who don't love their children and often will just let them do whatever they want. Right, never disciplining them, right? So this is not that. But also, more than just it's our fault and he disciplines us sometimes. Also, that second part, right? This trial, this, um, yeah, proving ground, really, where we come out better than we ever could have before, right? And it's not our fault. A father would also do that, right? Um, yeah. Oh, those were good, good connections there. Anything else? All right, let us move on to Rule 10. We'll just go right into it. Let the one who is in consolation think how he will conduct himself in the desolation, which will come after taking new strength for that time. So, this is the shortest of all the rules. And yet, we'll probably spend the same amount of time on him as, you know, the last one, which was the longest. Actually, not the longest, almost the longest. Anyways... Very simple. So, it says it right there in the first couple words. For whom is this rule? For whom is rule 10? Someone in consolation or someone in desolation? Consolation, consolation right? The rule is for someone who is already experiencing spiritual consolation. And yet, it's the same as rules 5 through 9. Ignatius gives us these rules to help someone in desolation. So he's saying here, before you even get to desolation, 
I'm going to help you against desolation, right? You can resist before it even comes. That is what Rule 10 is about, right? But we do it in spiritual consolation, right? We have our ups and our downs, and that'll be different depending on the individual for the length and the amount of times it switches. But we're talking about when we're up at the top, all right? Before we continue, I have my little quiz. What is discernment of spirits? Be aware. Be aware. Understand. Understand. Take action. Take action. All right, this is the basic paradigm, right? Paradigm. First things first, take action. That's either going to be accept spiritual consolation or reject spiritual desolation, right? That's what the take action means. So, in the Sermon of Spirits, this is, let's keep the main thing the main thing, right? When we're in spiritual consolation, the main thing is to what? Accept or reject. Yeah, accept. That's why God gives us the spiritual consolation, that we may accept it, right? That we may drink it in and embrace it and walk into this new life with our Lord. Right? This is the primary call of someone who is in spiritual consolation, to accept the spiritual consolation. Use an example from St. Elizabeth and Seton in your example booklet there. All right, so Elizabeth is 15 years old. She longs for the love of her father, who remarried after the death of her mother, and he is less present to her. And this is what she writes. Right? In the year 1789, when my father was in England, one morning in May, in the lightness of a cheerful heart, I jumped in the wagon that was driving to the woods for brush. About a mile from home, a boy who drove it began to cut, and I set off in the woods, soon found an outlet in the meadow, and a chestnut tree with several young ones not growing around it. Ri found rich moss under it and a warm sun. Here then was a sweet bed, the air, a clear blue vault above, the numberless sounds of spring melody and joy and sweet clovers and wild flowers I had got by the way. She is now experiencing non-spiritual consolation there, right? Nature is just beautiful, and she is basking in that reality. And from that comes, and a heart as innocent as human heart could be, filled, with even, filled even with enthusiastic love to God and admiration of his works. So we saw here a move from non-spiritual consolation to spiritual consolation, right? As it often happens. Then she says, God was my father, my all. I prayed, sang hymns, cried, laughed, talking to myself of how far he could place me above all sorrow. Then I laid still to enjoy the heavenly peace that came over my soul. And I am sure in the two hours so enjoyed grew ten years in the spiritual life. All right, so we see with just this classic intuition that the saints have, when the death, consolation comes to their life, they know what to do. And that's just accept it, right? That is what she's doing. We, Father Timothy Gallagher thinks we will probably not find a clear example in the Christian tradition of someone simply accepting spiritual consolation, right? That is what she is doing when she is 15 years old. Um, let's kind of skip the next one. That's about St. Francis of Assisi. Just basically reiterating that point. He did this all the time. Whenever consolation would come, he'd stop what he was doing and just bask in the spiritual consolation, because that's what he thought God wanted him to do, and it was. So we say all this to make a point. Rule 10 is about what to do in spiritual consolation. And we're going to say this. We should never let anything hinder us from accepting spiritual consolation, even Rule 10. It's possible that Rule 10 may hinder us from accepting spiritual consolation, but we're going to do everything we can to make sure we don't do that, right? Again, what is the primary call of someone in spiritual consolation? Accept. Rule 10 is about an additional call that can happen when someone is in spiritual consolation, and that is reject. Desolation that is going to come in the future, right? Not reject the consolation 
but reject the desolation, right? We're not going to let rule 10, that little thing on the right, stop us from doing the main thing, the thing on the left. Um, but we do need to know how to do the thing on the right. So, let one who is in consolation think how he will conduct himself in desolation which will come after, taking new strength for that time. So, after taking the primary action of accepting spiritual consolation, then one can take the additional action of thinking, right? We've seen this in other rules before, right? The action we're supposed to take is to call to mind something, to think about something. So if we look back at our 15-year-old Elizabeth, right? She's in the woods. She has this overwhelming sense of God's love and presence, and she thinks, oh, rule 10, I'm supposed to be thinking about the desolation that's going to come right now. Let me think. How am I going to overcome all those horrible times? You know, It's like, just relax, Elizabeth. You know, She does what she's supposed to. Just accept it. She can do Rule 10 a little bit later. right? In the moment, we accept the spiritual consolation. right? When would Elizabeth think about how she's going to overcome the desolation in the future? Right? Probably later that evening. right? She's still experiencing the residue or the warmth of that amazing experience. That'd be a good time to do it for her, right? Again, we're joining the primary good of consolation to the additional good that will help later, these reflection times, right? We can think of these when I'm going on a walk. That could be a good time to do that if I'm in consolation, right? If I'm exercising, even then, right? If I'm driving, right? Waiting to pick up the kids at the school, that's a good time to do this type of thing. Yeah. Quiet in our room. Realistically, though, I'm thinking... Well, it's possible that St. Elizabeth did not even do Rule 10, right? It's not like she would know about it. She's 15 years old. Uh, we're just saying that what would be a bad thing to do was for her to try and do Rule 10 when she should have been accepting the consolation, which is what she did do, and in which is what most human beings are very good at doing, right? It's, it, that's why it's consolation. It's, God's, it's easy to just accept that because it's so beautiful. Uh, so let's just, I'm just saying all this stuff so that we're not, you know, get all flustered when we do receive consolation and we think, oh, hurry up. What was I supposed to do? You know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's use an example from the book of Genesis. Joseph in Egypt. He's sold into slavery. He's made the you know prince of Egypt. And what does he do? Seven years of plenty. Seven years of family. During the seven years of plenty, he stores up grain, which he does not need. Right. And because he did that, he saved his life and thousands others, right? This was kind of a, an example, right, of consolation, we could say, right, an analogy. He's, ex he's doing what he's, the normal thing, and then he realizes, we have so much grain. What am I going to do? Well, let's store it up for the seven years of famine that I know is going to come, right? This is a good image for us in our spiritual life, because whenever we receive spiritual consolation, we know it is only a matter of time before the desolation comes. So the question is, right, what if I don't? think ahead, and prepare for the desolation, right? What will happen to me when that desolation does return, as inevitably it will, right? There may be a variety of things, but one thing that maybe will happen, and sadly sometimes does happen, right, is that when the desolation comes, there will be this disconcerting shock of surprise, right? We'll be really thrown for a loop, it really knocked off our spiritual balance, right? Our daily program of prayer, our spiritual initiatives, anything to do with our spiritual life, may suddenly, right, in some way or in some senses, a pretty intense way, collapse, right? If we're not ready for that desolation when it comes, that can destroy someone's spiritual life. And it takes a long effort, a long time to rebuild that if we kind of let that happen, you know. So it's important that we do take Rule 10 seriously because preparing during consolation is, again, one, kind of one of the easiest times to prepare for it. So let's take advantage of that. All right. Um, yeah, the bus example is what Timothy Gallagher, Father Timothy Gallagher says. Two men, they're on a bus. You know, they're holding on to their thingies. They're probably on their smartphone or reading the newspaper or whatever. They're not really paying a lot of attention to what's going on. The bus is going straight. They're fine. 
up ahead, there's a curve coming, right? So the one man, he does not pay attention. He is not aware that there's this curve coming. And when it does come, he's not ready. And he gets knocked off his balance because he wasn't, he didn't have time. He falls to the ground. His briefcase falls, splits open. The papers go everywhere, right? He gets hurt. It's not the end of the world, but that was not pleasant and completely unavoidable, right? Or avoidable. On the other hand, there's a second man who is doing the same thing. He's not uh, paying attention that much, but he does look up occasionally, right? To just kind of see what, what does he need to do. And he sees the thing coming, and so he, you know, widens his stance and just kind of stations himself. And then when the turn comes, he just whoo. And that's it. That's all that happens to him, right? This is a good, another good analogy for the spiritual life, right? When we're in consolation, we look up occasionally, you could say that, and prepare for what is, again, inevitably going to occur. And what are we supposed to be doing? Taking new strengths for that time, right? Because we know, we talked about this already, in desolation, it's very difficult to resist. And so it'd be helpful if we were stronger when it came. And so taking new strengths for that time. What does this look like in the concrete? Uh, Father Timothy Gallagher gives us seven examples, five of which he stole from someone else, so I don't feel bad about stealing all seven from him. <laughs> Number one, pray for strength in the future or for the future spiritual desolation, right? Again, a simple prayer. We're in consolation, and we just say something like, Father, I know this thing is going to come eventually. I want you to give me extra strength to help me, you know, in that desolation. Or Mother Mary, wrap your mantle around me, right? For when the enemy comes to attack me again, right? We're able to make those prayers with so much faith because we're in consolation, right? Those are good prayers to make. Do we ever do this, right? Oftentimes we can pray only when we're in desolation, right? Yeah. But consolation is a great time to pray for help ahead of time. Meditate on the truths of the faith that will sustain us in spiritual desolation. So this is what we were talking about in Rule 6, right? Those four things we can do to resist spiritual desolation. The first two are right here. Pray and meditate on the truths of the faith, right? Those spiritual arrows we have, right? Those quiver full of arrows we have that are ready, right? Those are go-to prayers whenever we're in desolation, right? Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Whatever those are, right? Um, a picture maybe, right? When we're in consolation, that'd be a good time to do the exact same thing. We read the Psalm 23 again. We look at our favorite picture of Jesus, right? My, my little prayer, you know. And that is because those prayers are so much more powerful when we're in consolation, right? And so if we kind of repeat those in our soul when we're in consolation, that builds up the strength of them when we whip them out when Rule 6 needs to be used, our desolation comes and we need to resist this thing, then those things, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, that has been built up as really true in my life because I was reading it when I was in consolation. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So both 1 and 2 are basically taken from Rule 6. Um, pray and meditate on the truths. Do these exact same things but in consolation. 3. Consider the value of spiritual consolation for growth. Right? This is what we were just talking about in Rule 9, right? Sometimes desolation comes. Um, yeah, and the Lord allows this to happen, permits this to happen uh, in order that we grow and spiritually mature. So when we're in consolation, um, we can trust that truth, right? The, the Lord does this for us. So we can plan, kind of resist ahead of time that, yep, it's going to happen and I trust my Lord that this is for a good reason, right? It's so much easier to do that ahead of time in consolation. Reflect on past growth. So number three is kind of more the abstract. Okay, God allows value to happen in desolation. I consider that value. Four is about just look at your past life, right? My own spiritual journey, right? And I try and remember how I have grown from my previous desolations, right? I look back at those times and I think, you know, again, when I'm in consolation, like, wow, look at how the Lord led me through that, you know, look at how I grew through that. Again, because I'm in consolation, it'll be much easier to do that and increase our faith for the future, right? When, again, I need to remember that I've been here before, God saw me through it, right? Five, 
resolve to make no changes in time of spiritual desolation, right? This is rule five that we saw in St. Ignatius' rules. Never make a change in spiritual desolation. So when we're in consolation, that's a great time to make a promise to yourself, you know? All right, I'm, I know what I'm probably going to be tempted to get rid of. I'm going to promise myself right now I'm not going to do that, right? Another thing that we can kind of, part of this fifth example of what to do in the concrete is we remember those times in the past in which we did make a change and we experienced the negative consequences of making that change. We remember that. Not to like, you know, shame us or something, but in a way to redeem the past, right? We use that as a way to see, oh, I shouldn't make a change. I've already experienced that I shouldn't do that. Um, that'll help me resolve to not make a change in the future because I know what will happen if I do. So we can take our past mistakes and, in a sense, redeem them in time of consolation by increasing our resolve to not do that again. Number six, review the 14 rules. We could actually just say know the 14 rules, right? Know them. So certainly right now you and I are in a very rare situation where we have nothing to do but to study the rules, right? Uh, that's a beautiful. We're taking eight weeks to go through these rules, right? That's eight hours that we're spending on this. That's few people in the world can do this type of thing, and we can do this type of thing. Um, but, you know, if we're honest, you know, how much of this stuff am I going to remember, you know, a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, five years from now, how much of these rules am I going to remember from these past eight weeks, right? It'd be a great idea to have some sort of way to remind ourselves, to review the rules, right? So that way I'm able to internalize them and on the fly, when I experience either consolation or desolation, I know what to do, right? So, I'd like your suggestions. How can we put this number six into effect, right? What are some little ways we can you know, incorporate the rules into our life or something like this, to review them more regularly or something like this. You know what I mean? You can include them in your, you know, some people, some people, and I'm pointing to the person, I know that she writes down, uh, if people ask her to pray for specific things, mm. she puts it down on a little book, a little tablet. Oh, okay. So, trying to incorporate some of these into some of the things that people ask you to pray for mm. is one way to be thinking about, okay, how do I do this? And which way am I going to take this? And not so much as that you're trying to match the rule to the situation, but that eventually, if you go through this often enough, it will just come to you naturally. Like, okay, this is what I have to do, and this is that I've covered. And that's, I don't think it's so much that we need to be uh, completely schooled in, 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 in the rules. I think that it loses its, its power. You have to internalize it, whichever way it's going to work for you. Yeah. Well, that's good. So, like writing them down, right? That can help. Any other thoughts? Well, and speaking of what Anna was talking about, what helps me, and I don't do it religiously or even all that faithful, but I do, I do do a lot of journaling. Mm. At night, I kind of just, whatever happened during the day, and I look back, and that kind of makes me think of how I could have done things differently, and it kind of puts things in perspective, you know, but if I've had a good day, a bad day, I jot it down, you know, whatever's going on, and I can see how it could apply to some of the Yeah. Journey. Yeah, if you were to journal and then you'd try to apply the be aware, understand, take. So journaling will help you be aware. And then if you have the rules at the same time of your journal, you can kind of see, you know, kind of do practicing from your own experience. How does this fit? Maybe you won't get it all the time, but that'd be a good way to do it. Journaling, you know, is a, is a big thing for sure, a big tool. Any other thoughts? I've just been reviewing the notes. Great. And, uh, going through them and, and um, sometimes identifying Yeah, that's a definitely the easiest way. Review. Actually pick up your notes and review. Good. Uh, 
Any other thoughts? It would take time to do it. Yeah. I mean, if you have a, similar to right, like the, the journaling thing, right? If you have a specific time of the day that you kind of pull out the rules or something, and trying to apply your day to that. Yeah. And last week, I think journaling, journaling is kind of a, not kind of, it could be used as a, the final thing of your, like your final examination of the day. Mm -hmm. You're going to, like, okay, what, what good happened today, what bad happened today, and, and what did I learn from all these different experiences? Yeah, definitely. Some other examples would be, um, right, these are really just ways to help us keep them fresh, right? We're learning them now, but we want to kind of keep them fresh throughout our life in a way, um, right? Keeping them on our nightstand, maybe just have a list of them right there on their nightstand. And they're always going to be there until I throw them away, I guess. So I'll be physically reminded by looking at it. Or, right, some people tape the rules to their dashboard on their car. When they get in in the morning, there they are. And they just look at them, maybe one of them a day or something like this, you know. Um, or having them at their desk at work or using maybe their phone to remind them. Some people who are pretty tech savvy can program their phone to like send them one rule a day at a certain time. So they're constantly just reminding themselves. Um, or a good thing you could do is to write a short personal summary of each of the rules in your own words. And then you have those in like your wallet or something. Right, because that way you understand what that means, because you wrote the thing, right? Again, to have that on your person, right? Again, the number one way to learn the rules is to teach the rules. So that's what I'm doing right now. Thank you so much for helping me do that. All right, so certainly I invite all, invite all here right, to take five to ten minutes before you go to bed tonight right, to figure out what you're going to do to keep these rules fresh in your mind, right? Five to ten minutes. You can figure it out and then do it, right? It doesn't have to be something big, you know, like review all 14 rules every single day. Probably doesn't have to do that, but something, right? All right, the last one. Seven way is to plan for specific situations of spiritual desolation. So, you know, when we're still in the warmth of God's closeness from our consolation, we might look at those weak points in our life, those points in our life where we are very tempted and often fall, right? And we'll look at those points in the consoling light, right? When we're close with God, right? If we wait to look at them when we're in desolation, it'll be much harder to figure out what to do. But if we're in consolation, we're looking at our weak points, we can plan with hope. How am I going to address this specifically, right? This is a thing I struggle with all the time, right? There can be a plan, and when you're in consolation, it's easier to come up with a plan. So after we fall to a common temptation, the enemy will always bring shame and discouragement immediately after, right? He'll tempt, 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 we fall, then it's going to be shame, shame, shame. And that's very debilitating in the spiritual life. He likes that. But in consolation, we're already away from all that shame and discouragement thing. But in consolation, we know easily that this is a tactic of the enemy, right? That shame, shame, shame thing. So we resolve ahead of time to read Psalm 130. Good example. Great psalm to read after we sin. That same sin we keep doing. We fall in the same way. If I resolve in the time of consolation to read Psalm 130 every single time, I know exactly what I'm going to do when I do fall. And the devil's going to be throwing the shame at me, but I'm already... Doing the thing that's going to block that, right? Psalm 130, beautiful psalm. Um, again, if we're in desolation, we, we probably will maybe internalize that shame and think we deserve that type of thing and, and that we, we, we don't really have this hope. You know, I'm, I'm always going to be doing this sin or something like this, you know. Uh, but if we plan ahead of time, that'll be very helpful, right? Or classic one, the weekly meeting at work that we dread every time we go to that meeting, right? It just kills us. And so we set a reminder in our phone five minutes before that meeting starts. Every week, it's the same time. And we ask a little prayer, right? Lord, give me the strength to endure this meeting, right? A very concrete plan for a situation that keeps happening over and over again. Does that stuff make sense? 
Let one who is in consolation think how he will conduct himself in the desolation which will come after, taking new strength for that time. So, bottom line, we can begin the hard work of resisting spiritual desolation before it even comes. And we can be begin it when it's easy. Right? That's the point of Rule 10. Right? Again, but what's the primary response to spiritual consolation? Be aware, understand, take action. What's the action that we take with spiritual consolation, the primary one? Accept it, right, not Rule 10. Right. That's the additional action. All right, the end. Questions? I feel like I missed something here. No, that's fine. Okay, four more rules to go. Next two weeks. So it'll still be Advent, the fourth week of Advent, when we finish this. And maybe we'll figure out what to do, because it can be helpful to have a follow-up class or a review or a question class. Um, but we'll figure that out later. Listo? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the consolations which you have given us over our life. We thank you as well for all the desolation that you have permitted us to endure, that we may mature and grow and convert and become that saint you have destined us to be to set this world on fire. And you've destined us through it, particularly through the desolation. You always give us the grace to resist. We thank you for that. We ask you that you remind us of this truth and to grant us that reminder in the time of consolation that we may draw strength ahead of time and so conquer the enemy and become who you designed us to be. We ask this through the intercession of our most blessed Mother Mary as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Hmm.